the Department of English, Diamond Harbor Women's University, in collaboration with Baba Sahib Ambedkar Education University. It is our honor to have Professor Blanka Nautkova Kopkova with us today. Before we begin, we have a small felicitation program. After that, we will move on to the program per se. Uh, our Vice Chancellor now, she has, uh, of course, wished us all the best for this particular program. She is in an important meeting, so she couldn't be meeting it right here now, but over during the time, she might uh, actually come for this particular program. I would now uh, request our student volunteers uh, to be ready for the felicitation. Uh, I would first welcome our honorable speaker for the day, Professor Blanca. I would request my colleague, Kumar Aditya Sharkar, to please do the honors. The student volunteer, Narayan Mahato. I would now request Malo Shimanda to welcome our register, sir, Sahidur Rahman, and felicitate him. Our student volunteer, Shagurika Chakraborty. I would request now my colleague, Dr. Habib Subha, to come and felicitate our chairperson for the day, Dr. Biplav Chakravorty. Without much ado, we will move straight on to the program. I would now request our register, sir, Dr. Saidu Rahman, to please give the welcome address, sir. Good afternoon. We have with us Dr. Biplav Chakravorty, a retired professor of Badwan University and the director of Innovative Center for Cultural Studies, who will chair the session, and Professor Dr. Blanka <coughs> Natkova Kapkova. Professor in the Department of Asian Studies, Metropolitan University, Prague. She is a renowned Indologist and had enormous works in search for modernity in the post Tagore Bengali poetry. She will deliver her lecture on <coughs> gender literary analysis, theories and examples from Bengali literature. We have with us the register of this university, Sri Kunal Kanti Jha, Professor Dr. Amit Kumar Bhattacharya, Controller of Examinations, Sri Ubijit Vishash, Finance Officer of this university, Sri Shopan Kumar Rai, Deputy Register of this University, and our teachers from Diamond Harbor Women's University and Baba Shaheb Ambedkar Education University, and my dear students, I welcome all of you to this important lecture program. 
I do hope that these two, all of us will be enriched from the lecture of Dr. Blankova and particularly the students' community will be enriched. Thank you very much. Uh, we will now move on to the academic session. Uh, we welcome our speaker for the day, and I would now uh, welcome my colleague, Dr. Habib Subhat, to please introduce the speaker. Thank you so much. There's a great uh, philosopher Sartre once said that we must strive to give us to give us to our life. And today's program is one such occasion which has immense potential and possibilities uh, of enriching our intellectual self. And it is my pleasure to introduce the, the person who is going to spread ahead this noble cause through her illuminating lecture, and she is our most respected and beloved Professor Blanca. She did her PhD on poetry of Bengali modernism. Currently, she is an associate professor at the Department of Asian Studies, Metropolitan University, Prague, Czech Republic. At the same time, she is also the academic guarantor of the study program and member of the academic council of the same university. She also teaches gender studies in the Faculty of Humanities, Charles University, Prague. Dr. Blanca is widely known for her expertise in the field of gender studies, cultural studies, and post-colonial studies. In the year 2009, she published one of the important books, Archetypes of Femininity and Their Representation in Modern Bengali Literature and Culture. In fact, she has published a number of such academic texts in India, Britain, Poland, Slovakia, Netherlands, and also in USA. Apart from all these, she is a perfect combination of mind and heart. Therefore, she is very close to many of the Indian universities and institutions where she has delivered a number of important lectures, like university like Jagadpur, Kolkata University, Guwahati University, Sister Nivedita University, and most importantly, the Sahitya Academy in New Delhi. She has also translated a selection of poems on of post tagore authors from Bengali to Czech. She currently focuses on literature of Bengali female authors, especially Mahishwata Devi and Malika Sengupta. In recognition of her immense contribution, she was awarded the Bankim Chandru Literary Prize for the year 2022. With this brief introduction, I thank you, Madam Professor, for being with us. Thank you, Habib, for that. Uh, you know, we'll just continue with the felicitation program a little longer. I would now welcome uh, Professor Amit Bhattacharya, and I would request uh, Kumar Aditya Shankar to please do the honors. Before I move on to the academic session and with the introduction with our chairperson, uh, we do have uh, the Dean Faculty of Arts, Dharma Harbor Women's University, online with us. I would request Aparaja Dadi to please say a few words. Can you just hold the mic there? Yes, Aparaja Dadi, if you could. Yeah. Can you, can you all hear me? Hello. Yeah. Can you hear me? All right. So, good afternoon, everyone. As Peter said, I'm Professor of Faculty of Arts, Diamond Harbor Women's University. Now, right at the outset, I should confess that I'm extremely sorry that I could not be there personally with all of you out there. But I dare say, 
uh, that I might not be there physically, but I am very much there in spirit, expecting to have a good academic time as much as all of you. I extend my warmest thanks to uh, Dr. Blanka Notkova Kapkova, who has come to our beloved country all the way from Prague in Czech Republic, which again is another beautiful country. I've been there. Today she will talk on gender issues with examples taken from Bengali literature. Since she is an expert, she has her expertise on modernist Bengali literature. Now it all sounds so very arresting that I, for one, am enormously excited to, to hear her talk. This kind of academic exchange is what rejuvenates us and you know, recharges our intellectual batteries, so to speak. So without further ado, I wish Dr. Blanca all the very best for her lecture today. I also extend my heartfelt greetings to the other erudite dignitaries. We have Professor Biplop Chakraborty, Professor Amit Bhattacharya here, uh, who have uh, been good enough to make time for us today. Uh, it is indeed very kind on, on their part. Now, can't wait to hear all of you, but before I sign off, I need to extend my heartiest gratitude to our Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor Shoma Bondabadai, who is always the one, you know, to give us that necessary shot in the arm when we really venture out into something new and want that. And I just have to thank our very own Registrar, sir, Professor Saidur Rahman, whose quiet but solid support sees us through many an endeavor. So thank you, Vice Chancellor, ma'am, and Registrar, sir, for being there always for us. And last but not the very least, I need to thank Dr. Kunal Kanti Jha, the Registrar of BSAE University, without whose support and help, we could not have pulled this off. So now let's tighten our seatbelts and launch into the intellectual journey we've all been waiting for. Thank you all once again. I'm, I'll be here on this part of the screen and uh, listening with rapt attention to all that goes on stage. So thank you once again, and may the events begin today. Thank you, Madhumita, over to you. Thank you, uh, Operator Dadi, for that. I would now uh, have this brief introduction to our Honorable Chairperson for the day, Dr. Viplav Chakravorty, who is the president of the organization ICCI LLSR. He has a PhD and an LLB degree to him, a delete in literature. He is known for his style of Lokobaro. Uh, and uh, of course, in Bangla comparative literature, he is the pioneer of what can be said to be comparative history, history studies. He has been with his lectures and academic ventures, has given his lectures in our country, America, Australia, Europe, uh, South America, South Asian countries. Uh, he has more than 85 books to his credit. He has been for a long time, you know, the visiting lecturer of the university at Greece, TCC. So we, uh, we welcome you, sir, and it is absolutely an honor to have you as the chairperson. And today with us is also our discussant, Amit Bhattacharya. Uh, I would, of course, uh, you know, give a very brief introduction to uh, the academic uh, excellence that, you know, sir is, of course, known for. Uh, Professor Bhattacharya has studied in the special discipline of Nea Vashika in the Department of Sanskrit of the University of Calcutta and stood first class, first in any examination. He was honored with a number of awards and scholarship, including two gold medals and a silver medal from the University of Calcutta. His primary interest, however, rotates around the Katha discipline of Indian philosophy. Throughout his illustrious career, Professor Bhattacharya has published numerous research papers in both national and international journals and has taught at several esteemed institutions in Bengal, including Narashima Dotto College, Nava Krishna Mission, Vidya Mandi, Rabindu Bharati University, Sanskrit College, and Bordhaman University, and has also served as the professor and head of comparative Indian language and literature at the Uni University of Calcutta 
and is currently serving as the controller of examinations of Baba Sahib Ambedkar Education University. He's a life member of several academic organizations, including the Asiatic Society Kolkata, Shanashtuta Shahitya Porishad, Bodho, Dharmobhar Shota. As a resource person at Nalanda University, Professor Bhattacharya has been contributing essays on Buddhist philosophy and thought since 2005. So, you know, he has, of course, a number of books, more than 25 books published, and to his credit. So, it is again an absolute honor to have him. Now, we will begin with the lecture that we are here to hear. And of course, the topic of the lecture is Gender Literary Analysis. Theories and examples from Bengali literature. Ma'am, this page is yours. Namaskar. Apnader ya nimuntro ner jamno onik dhunna baar bolte chahi. Ami khub khushi je hoy pandemir shomoy kore abar Kolkata ar Bharat e aste perechi. To o apnader o ye Czech Republic e Czech hi apne amate se aste paren. Ache ekta program kar nam hote Erasmus Mundus eta academic program. आर ओय प्रोग्राम द्वारा छात्र छात्री अमर देश खाने बा तुमरा अमादर देश जेते पारे ताहले अपना देर अध्यापिका तार का छे ओय जे वेब पेज इनफॉरमेशन हो बे आर आशा करे जे अपना आर अमादर विश्व बुकावर मुद्द है now, if you don't mind, I will switch to English because, in fact, I was uh, in Kolkata and in India more than 20 times, but there was maybe just one or two conferences uh, where Bengali was the medium of communication most of the conferences were in English, so I just uh, was accustomed to present uh, my lectures in English, but maybe in future that might change, who knows? Well, 
Um, I will speak about literature and gender analysis of literature, just a few theoretical outlets, and then try to demonstrate it on some examples from Bengali literature. Uh, I chose such which I guess that everybody knows. Well, we can stem uh, from a literary theorist uh, whose name was Judith Fetterle. Um, she wrote a very important uh, uh, article um, uh, where she begins with the sentence, literature is political. What does it mean? How uh, do we understand this statement? Of course, it doesn't necessarily mean that uh, literature should be somehow attached uh, to big politics, to political parties or whatever like that. But we must take the word political from its Greek, old Greek origin, polis. Polis means community. And uh, so literature is political. That means that um, it reflects and influences back the life of a community that we can hardly write literature or read literature without um, uh, um, an, an interest or um, any communication with the community. Uh, so um, another thesis of uh, Fetele is that literature very much influences the gen our gender socialization. Since we read the fairy tales, Usually, as children, small children, we already incorporate uh, some of the concepts of good and evil, of uh, uh, good women, bad women, good man, bad man, of gender stereotypes, of gender roles, and of gender order. So, um, many of the fairy tales until today, although the modern fairy tales differ already a bit from that uh, model. So they say us that there is a princess uh, who is always passive. Of course, she's beautiful because who would be interested in, a, in an ugly princess? No, uh, no hero would be interested to, uh, to uh, liberate an ugly princess. So beauty is her feature, her characteristics number one. But she is passive and she is either kidnapped or she is uh, uh, imprisoned by a bad wizard or whoever. And then there is the active male hero who, of course, acts, who is dynamic and who fights the evil. His counterpart is the villain also mostly a male, and he wants to kidnap, he wants to rape, he wants to violate orders, etc., etc. Of course, the good must conquer evil. This is the sense of the fairy tales. And what is the um, happy end which should be expected and which brings uh, the feeling of being happy? It is, of course, wedding, that finally the beautiful princess marries the active and strong hero who conquered the villain. So this is how gender socialization works. And uh, small children, girls and boys, in fact, uh, unconsciously, more or less, uh, um, identify themselves with these beautiful princesses and with these strong male heroes. However, what if the particular child is different? Let's say I am a small girl. I don't want to be passive and I'm not beautiful. So what shall I do? With whom shall I identify myself? So these are then some traumas since the very childhood, which we are imposed by these modal stories, which are repeated by literature. So we come to the issue of representation. 
how um, women are usually represented or at least have been in literature and how men um, were represented. So there uh, are in fact some stereotypes what women should do, what they should not do, and the same for men, for example. So that is very limited, limiting, and as we grew up, we may realize that we feel different. But what does it mean? That we are something other. I will still come back to the concept of otherness. Then, uh, approaching literature, um, theorists like Fetale and others, like, for example, the French Helen Sisu, or by origin Indian, now um, uh, um, a part of the um, American Academy, Gayatri Chikorbati Spiva, they very much emphasize the concept of a voice. Who can speak? As Spiva has the, uh, this uh, uh, famous essay, can the subaltern speak? So what does it mean to have the voice? It doesn't only mean that, of course, one is not dumb, but it means that your voice is listened to, that there are people who want to listen to you and that they care for what you are saying and what you want to say. The problem with the so-called subaltern or people who are marginalized, who are discriminated, uh, so is that uh, although they speak, nobody listens, nobody cares. And that's why <clears throat> these people simply get accustomed to be silent. Because their experience is, uh, their experience is nobody cares. So why, why should I say anything? It is simply in vain, which is very sad. So what Spivak says, it, it does not mean that um, we could give the space to the subaltern so that they could speak. That would be a sort of uh, uh, quite conceited imperial benevolence. Nobody can just give space. But uh, we shall share the space. It is not our space. We are not the owners of the space for speaking, so we should listen to each other and all people should share the space so that their voice would be listened to and their wishes and dreams um, and so on would be somehow taken seriously. Then uh, classical literature, uh, starting with the fairy tales, usually brings the dictate of heteronormativity, uh, which means that uh, it may not be quite um, articulated there, but uh, it inherently is there uh, a part of the story, that there are just um, uh, heterosexual men and heterosexual women, no other persons, no other heroes, heroines, or whatever. So again, LGBT or it's a very young development. <clears throat> then, of course. Uh, uh, classical literature, and even, history, even a part of the modernist literature, was full of gender archetypes, gender stereotypes, and gender, and gender order. Gender order is about power, meaning uh, the hierarchy, mostly men and women, so that hierarchy uh, can be called as either androcentric discourse can be in many respects in many respects um, it ascribes and certain women 
Um, yeah, this is usually done even by many in terms in the Bible, the
connected with nature. Uh, we can find the representation of woman as Mother Earth and also um, yeah, Mother Country, Mother India. This is quite interesting that this has, of course, mythological connotations. And then in the nationalist discourse, we can see the feminine line of religion, but there is one big but. Um, although uh, during national revival movements, women have uh, often been um, um, uh, supported uh, to participate in, um, it was mostly in the role of the mothers, perhaps educated mothers, who would uh, educate their uh, children, especially sons, and these sons would become uh, the fighters for freedom. So uh, um, uh, it's a bit limited role which the women are uh, attributed to. And it is not only the issue of Indian National uh, Revival Movement, but it is quite typical even, even for other National Revival Movement. It is quite typical picture if there is, let's say, a um, foreign enemy, the nation fights for freedom. So, okay, the discourse is women, please join us. Women join and then uh, the new state is uh, established, but what happened? Uh, prevails. Then, what about um, yeah, uh, a woman as mother? It may be a symbol of home, of course. Home, refuge, safety. This would be typical for Jibunananudo Das uh, poem, Bonolo Tashen, I guess all of you know it, where um, yeah, um, this picture of mother uh, blends with a picture of refuse, peace, safety, etc. And uh, also, there can be found a combination of the female image as a mother country, and human mother lover. If we speak about uh, the images one day in women, so they may sometimes, especially as mothers, um, rather bland, but let's have it that uh, uh, there will always is be uh, cities and rights of the goddess in women. The goddesses are independent. They can do whatever they want to, and they have this right. But uh, that's not uh, the case of mundane women. For them, uh, there is Manus laws, and all these traditionally hierarchical orders to which they should subdue. Of course, here I am speaking about the classical tradition. And I know very well that during the 19th century, by many of the, especially Bengali reformists, uh, there were many attempts to, to, to change it, that there were uh, even emancipist um, uh, efforts among men uh, like Ramohan Roy, like Ishak Chandra Bideshagor, like Rabindranath Thakur, of course, and so on. So I'm not going to general, generalize. <clears throat> then, um, what is quite interesting that uh, um, um, the image of the female can also be portrayed as uh, water. Again, in mythology, it can point to some goddesses, well, mostly, uh, mostly rivers like Shoroshoti um, uh, or Gonga, of course, on the first place. But also uh, the river can personify uh, the, uh, the beauty 
and there are some metaphors of let's say the waves waves like uh, waves of hair or uh, charming hands etc etc again this blending of um, the pictures of nature and the pictures of femininity are very very typical i would say not only in the bengali poetry so then uh, yeah, i just picked up uh, one more uh, metaphorization of woman as idol and uh, yeah, was quite interesting for me where some um, uh, some uh, poems where uh, this uh, image of idol was somehow um, questioned for example in shunal gongopan has um, um, uh, poem de kaholona or utam das uh, poem um, shudhui protima in this uh, there is always a question well is this idol is it a, a living being or is it just a stone and this is the um, question that the poem tries to uh, to uh, answer well in both of the cases in fact the ant is open so is it just an idol or is it just a stone or is it a living being is it a real image what is quite interesting here i would like to bring the case of shatajitra's film debi if you if you saw it where <clears throat> Um, uh, an old uh, gentleman has a dream that his daughter-in-law is an incarnation of the goddess Kali, and so as she is very obeying, so she is put to the pedestal, and people are coming to her, uh, asking her for mercy, uh, for curing their children. One of the child really gets cured, and so her fame even um, um, grows. But what does it bring for the girl? Uh, in fact, it steals her life for her. So she is as if locked um, uh, in the image of a statue, and she cannot decide anything more about her life. So this is not liberating role for her, but uh, uh, very much uh, um, oppressive role. And the film uh, ends uh, with her madness. So uh, quite a sad story, but very well, uh, very well done and written. Then, of course, it would not be poetry, body poetry, if a uh, um, wom woman was not portrayed as a lover and as an erotic symbol. Here, uh, we can't but um, bring the example of Shunil Gangopadhyay Smira. Uh, if you know uh, this, uh, uh, this heroine from many of his poems and also collections uh, of poems. <clears throat> uh, so near is of course a beautiful, um, uh, beautiful lover. Uh, she's also a sort of a muse that she's, um, uh, she gives inspiration to the poet. She, uh, this image also blends with, uh, with the image of motherness, of refuge, of peace, etc. All of that charm, elusiveness, mystery. Yeah, that is also typical for the two archetypes of earth and water, that uh, they are mysterious, because what is under the earth? What is in the depth of uh, a water? There is darkness, we don't see it. So that may be understood or interpreted as uh, uh, the matter of the womb and also of femininity. Well, Femininity is something mysterious, and we never understand it. <clears throat> then, uh, another uh, discourse would be the social critical one, when a uh, woman is portrayed as the oppressed. 
So here we can bring as examples uh, two Rabindranath Tagore's, uh, well, not just two, but I have selected two of them uh, poems, uh, Shantali Me and Kaume. And uh, here, especially in Shantali Me, um, there is a typical um, uh, field uh, for intersectional uh, analysis and interpretation. Because who is this Shantali Me? She is a Dalit, she is a tribal um, person, she is a poor person, and she is a woman. Um, <clears throat> what is quite interesting that the poet uh, is looking at her working, there is even some self-reflection and self-criticism of the narrator, because he says within the text, well, uh, I have uh, hired all these people to work for me, to build, uh, build up my veranda, my, uh, my um, uh, house. And so I have as if torn this woman from her village, from her family and uh, from her community just for money. So he reflects his situation but this is where it ends. Uh, there is not a, let's say, conclusion of the sort that he would give her more money or he would support her in any way. There is just this self-reflection, which, however, Sam ends by this declaration. And also, and it is uh, quite typical for Rabindranath's poems as well, that with uh, women of darker skin, um, uh, the poems uh, uh, describe them as beauties, which, let's say, is a, um, a subversive way of, uh, uh, of picturing, because the traditional um, uh, concept was that um, white skin or, or light skin um, is uh, more pretty. But this can uh, find its reflection in Kalome, in Krishnokari, which is very famous, and so on. Also in his poem Africa, for example. Yeah, so um, yeah, this uh, respect and also feeling uh, for, uh, for uh, dark-skinned girls as uh, pretty and beautiful, although discriminated. <clears throat> then um, uh, there are, of course, the authors who portray uh, uh, women as a um, say symbol of oppression. For example, Bangladesh uh, Azad in his poem Jegeo Thonari, which is quite an um, agitating poem that if, uh, if um, the woman uh, will wake up, so uh, it will wake up the whole world uh, together with, with her. Um, uh, what is quite interesting um, are uh, various uh, um, portraits of women in uh, um, uh, poems of the same name. I just brought here three examples. Rabindranath's poem Nari is, I think, from Choitali. Then Shunil Gongopadha's poem Nari. And uh, then there is also Toslima Nasrin uh, poem Nari. So uh, Toslima Nasrin poem uh, Nari is the most, let's say, first plain and open, uh, openly critical. Uh, openly agitating against the discrimination of women. Uh, then uh, Rabindranath is a very different one. Uh, it is a um, picture of a woman as a muse. So, and also to some uh, extent, uh, uh, Rabindranath's Nari in this poem from Choitari is objectified because the poet himself is the creator of this uh, image of the woman who is beautiful, who is inspirative, etc., etc. But she is not there for herself. In Shunil Gangopadha's uh, Nari, it is very interesting 
because uh, <clears throat> um, the stanzas uh, just show us women in various social positions as uh, mothers, as uh, workers, as whatever else. And finally, uh, the text asks, uh, where are you women? And uh, the end is, there is just a small light as it disappearing in the water. So that's very nice because it's also, at least I liked it, um, because uh, there I would say is clearly shown that there is a plurality of the images of, whom, uh, of women. There is not just one woman with capital W, but there are many women in many situations, in many personal uh, lives and so on. And uh, so we must just uh, perhaps, uh, all of us should perhaps try to understand it, uh, to um, uncover it, but not to generalize them. <clears throat> well, if, uh, uh, let's come back uh, to a theoretical I can just put uh, smaller. Yeah, you can see it's, it's too cold. Thank you. Um, uh, le uh, let's come back to the uh, to the uh, theoretical perspective. So, um, um, as I spoke now about the plurality of uh, um, the images of women or portrayals of women, this is also what stands. Okay, what stems from the concept of feminism since 1990s, that uh, we should not generalize and men and women are not two homogeneous uh, groups. Um, so what does it mean to read as a woman? However, is there just one way of reading? Of course not, if we are different. And is it the same to read as a woman and to read in a feminist way? What do you think? If I am a woman, uh, do I always read, must I always read in a feminist way? Or are there women who don't read in a feminist way? Of course, yes. Who don't read in a feminist way? Definitely, yes. So to read in a feminist way, it is not about being bi biological woman, but it is about our ideological uh, perspective. And so can we read in a feminist way? Of course, yes, of course. Because again, it's not again biology, but it is about the ideological uh, standpoint. Uh, so, um, just if we say that um, uh, we read as women, that would refer uh, or should refer to a specific place and time. Because, let's say, in a country where women are deprived of some rights, so to some extent they will share um, the same political and social situation. So this experience perhaps can give them a perspective of reading which will be similar, but this is always culturally conditioned, politically, socially, and historically conditioned. This is, for example, what Spivak also uh, emphasizes, that there is no universal way of reading by women that it is always bound to a certain historical, political, social, and so on situation. And then, if we speak, this was for
um, uh, search change, social change. Uh, so uh, here, I would per uh, perhaps just like to uh, refer to Helen Cizou, a French post-structuralist, uh, post uh, feminist philosopher, uh, who has uh, written a very famous essay, The Laugh of Medusa. Who was Medusa? She was a um, she was a heroine from old Greek history, and uh, because she didn't want to marry Poseidon, so she was turned to an ugly monster. And uh, whoever saw her, so he uh, became stoned from the horror of how she looked like. And uh, uh, here, um, uh, Sisu just speaks about Medusa as the one who revolted, as the one who symbolized otherness. Well, with the concept of otherness, I, of course, refer to Simone de Beauvoir, um, you know, who says that woman was constructed historically and in Christian religion as the other. Um, the one who was ontologically secondary um, uh, and also her being uh, created as instrumental for the help of Adam and not just as, a, uh, as an equal being. So the Medusa um, personifies this uh, uh, otherness and revolt and Sisu then appeals on women readers Let's not be afraid of Medusa. She is not a monster. She is beautiful and she is smiling. Well, I'm afraid that I have spoken too much and too long. So let's stop here. And if there are any questions, I will uh, be eager to listen to them. Thank you very much. Hello, Rajesha, sir. Mudurita. Yeah. Question session. Uh, thank you, madam, for that wonderful, stimulating lecture. I think, you know, two very pertinent questions that this particular lecture has brought us with it is of course talking about the many silences in the portrayal of the woman. The fact is that you know it's not just the woman as a speaker, but how the woman is being narrated also defines her political position. By politics, I mean you know it is an identity. So in this lecture, we can, we have seen you know how these denials of identities have been more pertinent when it comes to, you know, layers of marginalization. But the marginalization has not only meant being a woman, but being a woman of another color. It could have meant that you're of another race. You're, it could also mean that you're of a different social position. So it, 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 it talks about, you know, the, uh, the reason why feminism continues. You know, we keep, keep on talking about waves of feminism. So therefore, you know, this gender analysis, you know, especially taking the Bengali texts, which had, I think, you know, a particular range and an area uh, from Tagore to, let's say, more contemporary authors like Mahashweta Devi, all of them, you know, of course, being concerned about this 
the position of the woman. And as, as, as rightly we can say, you know, where is the woman? You know, can the woman still say that I have spoken or I have been portrayed or I have been given, you know, the due, uh, you know, uh, I, I would say due resources to express myself. So that I think, you know, has been the beauty of this particular lecture. And uh, in the department, you know, we have been organizing such lectures and this was the 10th one. And I think, you know, in the recent past, we did have certain gender uh, specific uh, uh, lectures. Of course, you know, you know, Shukita Rani had also spoken to us, if you would remember about, you know, how Dalit feminism differs from the other kind of feminism. So, you know, the feminisms, is what this lecture has got us to. So thank you, Madam, for that. Now I would request our chair uh, to please uh, sum up this lecture. And uh, I would also ask uh, you know, our discussant for the day, Dr. Omid Bhattacharya, to also give his comments. So, At the outset of this beautiful deliberation given by Professor Dr. Blanca, I would like to congratulate her on behalf of both the universities, BSAEU and Diamond Harvard Owen University. Dayaha Vishwavidhalayaha Pakshataha Ohinanganam Karomu in Sanskrit. Our culture says categorically it is seen in Upanishad Atithi Deva Bhava Let your guest be God unto you. And uh, obviously, Dr. Ranga is Goddess. Let your <laughs> guest be God unto you. So, Atiti Deva Bhava. We do have an art of hospitality. We do have a sense of culture. We do have etiquettes and manners too. In our scripture, it is said, Lochuna Bhyam Vihinasya Darpana King Kurisha. Unless you have eyes, what Nira will do? Amar Jodi Chok Nathake, Tala Aina Ki Hab. Liberation, liberation, liberation. Emancipation, emancipation, emancipation. These terms cannot be applicable if, unless we have a perfect vision. So vision is very important thing. And due to this reason, in Buddhist philosophy, in Indian soil, Dharma Kirti wrote in the invaluable work Nayavindu Samak Gyana Purvika Sarva Purushartha Siddhi. So perfect vision is required. Our distinguished speaker, Professor Dr. Blanka, categorically mentioned. Sunil Gangopadhyay, Mahashita Devi, Malavika Shingupta, Mullika Shingupta, from various texts, and side by side, she also had given so many examples from those texts. 
actually we do have a, a art of argumentation and due to art of argumentation we can also cite so many examples from our chandi as because we do know that in between theory and practice a wide gap exists in chandi when sumuha and rishumuha both of the demons they proposed it should be kept in mind that coming 14 february is valentine's day and sumuha and rishumuha both came and proposed the devi goddess durga i would like to marry you sumuha and rishumuha told but devi suggested it is also a symbol of womanhood and the positive gesture of indian culture oh sure no problem at all will be to marry both of you but provided that i have some shortest जो मान जयती संग्राम जो मे दर्पण बपहती यो मे प्रतिवल लोके स्वामी भरता भविष्य आई वुड लाइक टू एक्सप्लेन जो मान जयती संग्राम इन बिटवीन यू हु विल बी एबल टू डिफीट मी इन वार जो मान जयती संग्राम जो मे दर्पण बाप होती इन बिटवीन यू हु विल बी एबल टू क्रैस माय बोस्ट माय दर्प यो मे प्रतिवल लोके एंड इन बिटवीन यू हु विल बी द कंपिटिटर ऑफ माय i assure that i will marry you what engaged in fighting and they both died and the devi was released and due to this reason india has had everything india particularly bears such type of culture positive negative both we have so our charcha our cultivation our struggle for emancipation and liberation it will be going on and on and on but as an ex officio of university vishwavidyalaya i can assure that i do not discriminate male examiner and female examiner and the teachers or faculty members who are sitting in front of me they also should not and must not discriminate among students through gender so if this kind of topic does not exist then seminar will not be run so you this in fund cannot be properly distributed and expense so i would like to thank dr blanka and uh, encourage her to highlight us for the young generation this kind of seminar and this kind of discussion is mostly welcome uh, actually innumerable texts in the epics dharma shastras and puranas emphasize the total denial of liberty to a man regarding liberation in the year 14th century madam in the year 14th century in jain scripture a great commentator was there then Gunaratna 
and the name of the commentary of Sardarshan Samuchaya, Tarka Ramusu Vipika. A question was raised. Asti Strinam Moksha. Does women have a liberation? This question was raised by the philosopher named Gunaratna in 14th century. And he replied, Strinavapi Moksha Shikaraniya. It also should be admitted for female too. Why? For liberation and emancipation, those paths are to be followed, and if those paths followed properly by the female too, they also can be liberated and emancipated. So literature, ages after ages, will be written. <coughs> New generation will come forward, but those scriptures and thoughts will exist in our heart, in our tutorial classes. Thanking all of you, I would like to conclude Sarve Sukhina Santu, Sarve Santu Nidavaya. Sarve Bhadrani Goswami Mahakusthit Dukha Mahakumar. May all of you be happy. Shabbat Shalom. Thank you, sir. And now I would request our chairperson, sir, to please uh, make these valuable observations. Everybody. Uh, it is my proud privilege to be here and to chair this session organized by Babasar Ambedkar University and Lavand Harbor Women University. I am also proud that Professor Blanca is with us and no hint to say that installation of which I am the president has recently honored Dr. Professor Blanca with an international award of Subunkim Chatterjee Memorial Bunkim Chandro Literary Award. 2022. I am equally honored that uh, Professor Shuma Madhavadhar, who is almost like a student of mine, has honored me by inviting uh, to chair this session and to comment on this. <coughs> Thanks to Professor Blanca, who has elaborately discussed and touched upon many salient points of feminist movement and inter-alaya other subjects. She has touched upon many aspects of this movement especially literary and socio-political movement, including humanization of the problem and he has run from right from Ravindranath Tagore to Bonolata Sen till Mahashaka Devi and Sunil Nandavadhyay and other related uh, authors. The broad aspect 
has acted as a as an eye opener for us all. Let me add one thing or two. Uh, either subject-wise or objectively, that this problem has been touched upon in Indian literature, especially Indian folk literature, till it reached in the hands of modern writers. Like Shuri Ganguly and others. Bhagavan Buddha in Dharmapada said like this Atmahi Atmana Natho Uhi Natho Padosya Atmanam Sudan Peno Nathan Lavati Dilavan. Here, there is no sex di discrimination. A person, identification of a person, of a gender, is one who can own his own rights by his own hands. There is no question of woman or man. And later, we find if you go to the folk tales or folk elements like lines, <coughs> folk narratives 